Hello, I'm Graham, and I hope everyone's having a great day. And welcome to episode three of this new video series that I'm running for new users to the Panasonic Lumix FZ300 330 camera. Now, if you're a new viewer, it's worth downloading the guide for this course, which is available on my photographic blog. I'll put a link to that in the video description below so you can actually download it. If you've already downloaded the book, then there are some additions to that book now from chapter three and chapter four. So you may want to download it again. And if you are going to print it out, you only need to print out pages 33 to 44. If you're a confident user of the camera, you might want to also check out my user's manual, which is now on Amazon. It's available as a color book or a black and white book. If you buy the black and white book, if you send me your order number from Amazon, then I'll send you the color PDF. So you've got the color document to work with as well. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at moving from the IA mode, which is fully automatic in every sense. We saw some ways we could tame it by using the IA plus mode, which gave us op options for color tint, background defocus and brightness control. But it didn't give us much control over the way the shot was taken in terms of ISO, the sensitivity of the camera or on where the focus was. By moving to the P mode with this camera, we have a lot more opportunities to be more creative with our pictures. We can get the image that we conceive in our mind. I often refer to the P mode as the ISO priority mode. We already have an aperture and shutter priority mode on the camera. I refer to the P mode as that ISO priority mode. So it allows you to set an ISO and have the camera determine an aperture and shutter speed combination for the ambient light based on the IO setting that you've made. I'll explain more about that as we go through the course. We'll now set up the camera so we can do some adjustments with the P menu and show you what's available, how to create better images by using that P mode. To record in the program auto mode, you need to turn the top control dial so that the P aligns with the white mark on the flash housing. When you do that, you'll notice that you get a P appear on the LCD, which confirms that you're in the program auto mode. Now, if you were to go into the menu choices while you're in the P mode, you'll find that you've now got an extensive range of menus that you can change the values in the camera. You can see that we've got seven pages of adjustments. This set of menus becomes quite intimidating for new users. And that's why in the pilot program, we just set up those options that are needed to allow us to use the camera in most of the modes without having to go into the menus again. Now, the first thing that the program auto mode gives you is the opportunity to set up the camera sensitivity. In the intelligent auto modes, the camera always maintained the control of the ISO and you didn't get the option to change it. So even if you had the camera mounted on a tripod and you had a dark situation, the camera would drive the ISO up to a very high value, giving you images with noise on. But here in the P mode, we can actually change the way the camera responds to light. In the moment, you can see that I've got an ISO value of 100 set, and that's my normal recommendation for this camera. If you try to use ISO over 400, you'll notice that the image becomes slightly noisy, as this is a very small sensor camera. So you can use the ISO control on the four-way navigation dial to set that value. When you cursor up and go into the ISO mode, you can see that we've got the choice of auto ISO, intelligent ISO, and then the manual values that you can assign to this camera. And they range from 100 up to 6400. Now you'd only use 6400 ISO as a very last resort if you needed to get an image. Normally you'll work within the range of 100 to 400. If you are going to use the auto ISO mode, and that is available if you go to the bottom, if you set auto ISO here, and then if you go into the menu, and you set the ISO limit set on page six to 800. It means the camera won't ever go above 800 ISO. So you won't run into the situation where you get noisy images. In the P mode, the camera will do its best to maintain the exposure by first of all, slowing down the shutter speed and then opening up the aperture until you get to F2.8. Once you've reached the minimum of F2.8, and the low shutter speeds, then you really do need to increase your ISO if you want to get an image under those lighting conditions. Here I'm going to set an ISO of 100 because that's my recommendation that you use. It gives you the lowest noise in the picture 
and it gives you the best range of colours uh, from darks to lights. If I was to press the shutter button, the camera will determine focus by the focus target on the screen now. And you notice that we've got a focus target that we can change position of. In the intelligent auto mode, we could only roughly change the position by using subject tracking. But in this mode, if we press our function button two, which we've uh, pre-programmed to give us direct access to the focus area, if I press function button two, you can see now we've got a target we can move the position of by using the four-way navigation dial. And we can also change its size by using the top control button. So we can make it small or we can make it as large as we need. So if you wanted to focus on a bird through branches in a tree, set to the smallest area uh, available from the camera. There is also a precise area of focus, but we'll talk about that later in the video. So here now I want to set the focus point onto this dragon's eye. So I'm going to move the position up and then across until it's sitting on the dragon's eye there. When I press menu set, that will be the target area for the camera. Now when I take the exposure, if I have to press the shutter button, you notice the camera is giving me an exposure of f2.8 with a shutter speed of 1 25th of a second. So if I take that picture, you can see the exposure there. Because this is a studio situation, I'm quite happy with the 1 25th of a second. I've got my camera mounted on a tripod, so there's going to be no camera shake. But if I was outdoors and I was shooting sports and I wanted a higher shutter speed, then in the program auto mode, I use a facility called program shift. Now program shift allows us to change this aperture and shutter combination, but the exposure will stay the same. So if I press the shutter button halfway down and then turn the top control dial clockwise, you'll notice that we bring up a double-headed arrow with a P symbol. That means we're into the program shift mode. So whilst the combination of shutter speed and aperture is on screen, I can now use this top control dial to change the aperture and shutter speed combination. So it gives me that opportunity to set something like f5.6, which I want for this particular shot, to give me more depth of focus between the front of the subject and the back of the subject. So now we will take this exposure with a one sixth of a second at f5.6. If I wanted a much faster shutter speed, obviously with this combination, I'm going to have to go down to f2.8 but I can only go to 1 25th of a second with this lighting condition. If I wanted a faster shutter speed, then I would have to change this ISO to enable me to use that faster shutter speed. So 1 25th of a second, if I wanted it to be a 100th of a second, then I'd have to go two extra stops or two complete increments on the ISO scale. So if I go to ISO and I go from 100 to 200, which is one stop, 400 which is two stops when I press the shutter button now we should see We've got one hundredth of a second at f2.8 So you can see how you can change your aperture or shutter speed and your ISO to gain the situation that you want I'm going to go back to the ISO 100 because we're shooting indoors If I was to use the quick menu Q menu here with a trash can icon function button 3 if I cursor into the one area options, you can see that I've set up for the large area by default, but we do have this precise pinpoint focus method. We've also got the custom multi, which allows you to define a shape, or we can use the 49 area as the intelligent auto does. We can use uh, focus tracking, or we can use the face and eye detection. So we can use any one of those focus modes in that one area method. If we look at the precise point, so if I press menu set, you'll now notice on the screen is a very, very small white cross. And if you move its position, you can't use the whole area of the screen. It is more or less in the center of the screen that you can use the precise focus point. When you've got the point you want, press menu set, and then that will come back and show you the white cursor. When you press the shutter button, you notice we've got a green indication that we've got focus lock on that particular focus point. 
back into the queue menu and we'll change that back to the single area method. Now one of the failings in the intelligent auto mode is the fact that white balance is always done automatically for you and in the P mode by default it uses the auto white balance method. Now there are some situations where that auto white balance can actually not give you the desired results and in my studio situation here that's one of the cases. My studio lights tend to be slightly magenta so if we've looked at that image in the background you probably felt that the image was slightly magenta looking. The background instead of being nice grey is a slight uh, magenta colour. So we can use what's called the manual white balance. And manual white balance is achieved by using the white balance button here on the four way navigation dial. So if I depress that you'll notice we bring up a scale which has got auto white balance and then some preset values. If we were outside in bright sunshine we could use the sunshine symbol. If we were in a clear cloud we could use the cloud symbol. If we were in a shady situation where there's clouds in the sky but we're in the shade we could use the shade option which makes it slightly warmer. Indoors if we're shooting with tungsten lights that's normal household filament lights we could use a preset for uh, that tungsten white balance. And now there are the four custom white balances that we can set. So we've got four independent controls of our white balance if we wanted to make four setups. I'm going to go to one that we've not already predefined and that's going to be the white balance number three. Now to do a white balance set procedure you either need a white piece of paper or a neutral grey card and you can buy these sets of neutral grey cards um, on Amazon or any of the local retailers and it's basically an 18% reflectance grey card. Neutral in colour so that it's not going to bias the uh, image anyway. So now when I go to the function white balance set operation, I can use the up arrow key. It will show me the area that's going to be used to define white balance. And providing your grey card or your white sheet is fully covering that area. When you press the menu set button, the camera will go through that process and set the white balance very accurately. If I now remove that grey card, you notice that this image is now more neutral. And if I take the picture, can look at that you'll see that it's more neutral. So providing my lighting situation doesn't change I can use that preset condition. Now in the intelligent auto mode the camera used what was called scene detection to determine what type of picture you're taking. It would look for the areas of colour and darkness and would determine whether you're shooting a landscape or a portrait, a food picture etc. In the program mode we don't have this scene detection but we use what are called photo styles. Now the photo styles are available in the record setup menu. So if I go into menu set and if I go to page one you notice we've got photo styles. By default you're set up with the standard photo style but if I press menu set you can see we can cursor through. We've got standard, vivid, natural, monochrome, scenery, portrait and then a custom setup. You'll also notice here in the standard photo style are four individual controls which once you get familiar with the camera you might want to make some changes to. Now these only affect the JPEG camera images. If you're shooting with RAW as well you won't change anything in the RAW file. These are only for affecting the JPEG output from the camera. If you don't want to do any subsequent post-processing to your images, if you just want to take these images out of the camera, then it's worth coming down and changing the sharpness to plus two. That will give you a slightly sharpened image as all JPEG images coming out of cameras normally require some amount of additional processing. Additionally, you might want to go down to noise reduction and just take that back to minus two as that will stop the camera smearing some of the very fine images that the camera is able to produce. So with a sharpness of 2 and a noise reduction of minus 2 if you're going to use the images directly out of camera without any post processing. If you are going to do your own editing then I found if I just leave those at 0 and then do my own post processing uh, everything's fine. 
with the other photo styles the vivid one will give you extra intense colors the natural one gives you a slightly softer contrast so if you've got a very high contrast scene you can use the new the natural mode and that will help you reduce the amount of contrast in that picture you'll see a chart in that new chapter 3 guideline which shows you the conditions that you can use both the range of ISOs and the types of photo style now we do get the option now to use the camera metering circuit remember in intelligent auto control it always used the whole area to determine what the metering was but in this particular P mode if I go into the record setup menu and we look at metering mode by default it's in the whole area but we can have what's called center weighted the center weighted takes the measurement from the central area of the screen so it's better in some respects than the whole area if you've got someone standing in the middle of the frame and you want the camera to expose them correctly rather than taking in the landscape behind so center weighted is valuable in some operations but one which is really important is the spot method so if you've got an object that's been illuminated uh, on its own in the subject say the moon against the dark sky you can use the spot metering to actually precisely measure one of the craters in the moon and get the right exposure it's also useful if you've got a subject with quite a high contrast range you can actually find the average by uh, using that spot to determine what the shortest exposure would be what the longest exposure would be and then roughly put it between the two to give you an average between the highlight and the shadow area but that's an advanced measurement technique but for for most people using the center weighted or the whole area would would suffice so i can show you how to use the spot meter now if i move the focus point by using the f2 key i can change the position and you notice that the camera is metering now from the background and if I have to press the shutter button you see that we're 1 40th at 2.8 if I press the shut the function button 2 again and come to one of the shadow areas in the image if I have to press the button you see it's a tenth of a second at f2.8 so you can see the range of exposures within that image so for if I wanted to expose for the shadows I would put my measurement point in the shadow if I wanted the highlights then I could place the measurement area in the highlight and get the measurement for the highlight and that's a 30 of a second so averaging out between the highlight and the shadow I would get about a 20th of a second and that's what the camera would give me using the whole area method so if we go back to whole area we see we've got about a 25th of a second which is the average between the highlight and the shadow areas if I felt that image was still slightly underexposed I can use exposure compensation we had that as brightness control in the intelligent auto mode but it's referred to as exposure value compensation when we're in the semi-automatic modes if I now press the function button 1 it will bring up the option for me to change the exposure value compensation or I can make the scene brighter by going to the plus side of the scale or I can make it darker by going to the minus side of the scale so depressing function button 1 you can see I bring up the adjustment scale between minus 3 and plus 3 and I want to make this scene a little bit lighter and I'm going to go just by one third of a stop so I go to plus one third when I press menu set that will be locked into the camera so now you can see the exposure is 1 20th of a second where it was a 25th so by using a plus exposure value compensation it's made the shutter speed go longer which makes my scene brighter so by using the P mode we've made our first giant steps away from fully automatic giving you a lot more control over how that image is created so you've got control of how you use the aperture or the shutter speed how bright the subject is by using exposure compensation you've got the control of sensitivity so you can either shoot with a very low ISO for low noise images or if you're forced to use a high ISO because of the lighting situation then you can use that creatively well that's it for this short video thanks very much for watching again in episode 4 we'll be looking at the aperture priority mode and the shutter priority modes and they open up some more creative possibilities for you for your photography so until then thanks again for watching please do take care 
I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye for now.